Hello, how you doing? My name is Kiwan Foster, and I am the pastor and church planner of Out of Love Ministries. And on behalf of the Out of Love Ministries community of faith, we would like to welcome you and thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We pray and hope that you are blessed by the word of God that is about to get ready to come forth today. Uh, we ask that you consider partnering with us as we partner with God to help spread the messages of the gospel around the globe. And you can do this by, sub by subscribing to our YouTube channel, by clicking likes on our videos, and by sharing these videos videos with others. And so again, welcome and many blessings unto you. We are currently um, involved in a sermon series entitled Damage But Not Destroyed. Today is going to be part three in that sermon series. If you have not had an opportunity to watch any of the other videos, the two prior videos, please, please, please um, go and watch those videos. I think you will be blessed by the content of those videos. You will be encouraged. You will be challenged. And again, uh, we invite you to go ahead and to listen to or view those videos. We'll make sure we include the links in the description box so that you won't have a problem being able to navigate to our YouTube page to find those videos. And so we're going to go ahead again and continue with our sermon series of damage but not destroyed. We're going to go ahead. Our focus passage of scripture that we have been looking at, that we've been teaching from is First Kings chapter 19, verses one through eight. So I'm going to go ahead and read those verses in their entirety. And the word of the God, the word of the Lord reads as such, you all. It says, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent the messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more. If I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow, then he was afraid and he rose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, it is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. And he looked and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat for the journey, my Lord and my God, is too great for you. And he rose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. Amen, amen, and a men. And I would like to speak to you today from this thought. It takes time. It takes time. And as we progress throughout the message, you will understand um, by that title what we mean or what I mean when I say it takes um, time. It is amazing to witness the advancement or advancements um, in technology over the years. I'm 39 years old and um, I graduated from high school in 2000, which meant that, which means that most of my time in high school, of course, was spent in the late nineties. And I think about the things that we did not have from a technological perspective. We didn't have any social media when I was in high school, you all. Walk with me now, make it make sense. Um, there was no Facebook at that time um, because we know that Facebook was created or developed or launched in um, 2004. There was no Instagram at that time while I was in high school because Instagram launched in, in 2010. There was, y'all walk with me now, you all. There was no YouTube 
at that time when I was in high school. And many of you all can identify with what I'm saying, especially those of you all who are a part of a generation where social media had not taken place and it was not established. There was no YouTube because YouTube um, was launched in 2005. And so, again, when you talk about the technological advancements that have occurred over the years, it's amazing to see how far this world, our country has come by way of technology, that, 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 that the things that you can do with technology is just mind boggling you all. You, you can be having a conversation with somebody and somebody can make a statement and you can say, now, hold on. I don't know if that's a factual statement. And you can literally within seconds, get on your phone and Google the statement that this person is making and probably find some a hundred, 200 or thousands of different articles and things that have been written based upon that statement right at the fingertips, you all. Technology has changed significantly over the years. And as a culture and as a world, we've benefited from the advancement of technology. And there's been some positive benefits, you all, don't get me wrong. But also at the same time, there have been some negative benefits as well to technology. And one of the most negative benefits of the advancement of technology, in my opinion, is that it has caused us to develop what I like to, um, to term as the instant gratification syndrome. Instant gratification syndrome, IGS, instant gratification syndrome, meaning that because of how fast we are able to have things at our fingertips based upon technology, that mindset spills over into other areas of our life and we look for that same speed, that same instant gratification to occur in other areas of our life. But it doesn't happen happen that way, you all, because I will have you to know that there are some things in life that you have to understand that it takes time. Oh, y'all better walk with me right now. It, it takes time. And, 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 and the reason it takes time is because time represents that it is a process that one must go through. Y'all walk with me right now. For example, for those of you who are, um, who are avid cooks out there and you like to cook, any good cook knows that when cooking certain dishes or cooking certain types of food, you have to make sure that you go through the process process and you have to make sure that you're not trying to rapidly speed through the process because any good cook knows that it takes time. Um, one of my dear friends and a number of you all know her, um, she went on to be with the Lord. Her name is Reverend Barbara Mitchell. She taught me this. She taught me this. And I always remember when I would, whenever I would go to her house to visit and she would be in her kitchen, in her chair cooking. She always wanted me to understand. She said, Pastor, listen, when it comes to cooking, and let me tell you something, you talking about a person who can cook. That sister was one of the best cooks I've ever seen in my life. And those of you all who know Reverend Barbara Mitchell, you know it is the truth, especially those of you all who are graduates of the McAfee School of Theology, and you had an opportunity to experience this woman of God's life, her ministry, and just her hospitality, her family knows it, we all knew that this woman loved to cook, but she always wanted me to understand, pastor, you can't rush certain things or when you're cooking certain foods, it takes time. And, and again, there's certain things in life that you have to understand. It takes time. It's a process. If you go in there trying to bake a cake that should take you about three hours with the whole entire process from beginning to end when it comes to mixing the ingredients and, and when it comes to um, doing some other things and then putting the cake in the oven. If it takes you about an hour and a half to two hours to go through that process in order for that cake to come out the way that you want it, that it needs to, if you go in there trying to do the or accelerate the process and complete what should take an hour and a half or two hours and you try to do it in 30 to 45 minutes, then what's going to happen is you're going to experience some problems. 
And one of the main problems you're going to experience is that the cake is not going to turn out the way you wanted it to. It may not taste good at all, or it may not taste as good as you are accustomed to. Y'all walk with me now, you all. I'm just saying there's certain things that takes time because it takes a process for the, here's what I'm trying to say. When you look in our passage of scripture today, you all, God will have us to understand that when it comes to him restoring us and restoring certain aspects of our life or areas in our life that we've been praying or we've asking God to bring about restoration or to renew us. God wants you to know it's not going to happen overnight. It's a process and it's a process that's going to take time. But there's some other things that God wants us to understand about this process of us being restored in specific areas of our life. And that's what I want us to deal with today. So remember, in this passage of scripture, our main character who's on stage, who the lights are shining on, is the prophet Elijah. Now, it's so important for us to understand this, you all. And I really haven't highlighted this because um, I, I just have not highlighted it. It's been in the back of my mind. I'm going to bring some of it out today. But the reason I have not focused on it specifically is because I have not targeted my message to go in this particular to go this particular avenue. But here's what I want you to understand about this particular passage of scripture. You all Elijah is not just any old person. Mm -mm. He's not just a child of God. Mm -mm. Elijah holds a high office, a very important office. He is a prophet called by God. And we know, according to the biblical narrative throughout scripture, and it is established in the Old Testament, that prophets served as the mouthpiece for God. So just like today, when you go to church and you hear a preacher preach and the preacher is preaching what thus, thus saith the Lord, the preacher serves as a representative, a messenger, a ambassador on behalf of God. Yes, you can read your Bible and the Lord can communicate to you, but the scriptures declare and decree that God has set up the office and within church leadership where God will use the God will use the pastor and the leaders to communicate what thus saith the Lord. But again, you can read your Bible and get a word from the Lord as well. But that does not negate and that does not diminish the role that the pastor or church leaders play in the scriptures and in the life of the church. Well, for the prophet, it was the prophet served as the mouthpiece of God, a, a mouthpiece of God, as I said. So whenever God had a message that he wanted to get to the people, God will send his prophet and the prophet will speak the message of God and the people will either adhere to that message <clears throat> Excuse me. Or they would reject <clears throat> that message. So again, Elijah plays or he has a he has a significant role you all. He's a prophet. A man called by God to do God's bidding. Now, here's the portion of this story, you all, that I told you that I have not really focused on a lot. And I want to share this passage of scripture, you all, and many of you all who are in ministry, who serve in whatever context of ministry, whether you are a pastor, assistant pastor, whether you hold a ministry coordinating position, whether you are in um, 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 worship leader, um, worship pastor, those who serve in ministry, whether you are participating in outreach missions for those who are in ministry, this passage can be used to show the importance of ministry burnout and how God can nurse us back to health. This passage of scripture, you all, can be used, especially in times of what we're going through right now with this pandemic. This passage of scripture speaks loudly and clearly to those who are in leadership positions in ministry, you all. And here's why I say this, you all. This man of God, remember, he dealt with. And in this passage, we see him dealing with what? 
disappointment, discouragement, and depression. And all of these things came by way of his ministry assignment. This man of God has experienced ministry burnout by way of him being involved in ministry. He's discouraged. He's depressed. Listen to me, you all. I know this is a side note, but I want to say this. The spirit of God is leading me to say this. I didn't even write this down in my notes, you all. God had put this in my spirit right before we turned on the camera and started recording. And the Lord pressed in my spirit. You need to say this. Please pray <clears throat> for if you have a pastor. Please pray for your pastor and the church leaders. And even if you don't have a pastor of a church leaders, I'm asking you to please stand with me and lift up church leaders all over this world, you all, because I want you to understand you have church leaders right now, you all, who are discouraged, who are disappointed, discouraged and depressed because of what is going on as it relates to this pandemic. I've been reading articles, some articles from um, Tom, um, Tom Rayner, who is the excuse me, who is the leader and CEO over Lifeway, um, Lifeway Resources, Lifeway Christian Bookstore. And I've read some articles where he said that his team, his team, because he deals with, um, he does um, church, um, church consultant work. He said that his team are receiving significant calls every week of pastors who say that they're about to get ready to, to resign. They're getting ready to throw in the towel and leave. Why? Because they're disappointed, they're discouraged, and they're depressed because of everything that this pandemic has created. You got pastors who are serving in congregations where it's split down the middle. Half of this church want to resume, half of the members in this church want to resume with going back to worship. The other half say, no, pastor, we don't need to, no church leadership. We don't need to resume with worship. We need to just stay where we are right now and continue to shelter in place and take this seriously. Pastor, we have underlying health conditions. Therefore, we're not coming back. So pastors are having to deal with that and a number of other different things. They're having to deal with their giving being down because you have millions of Americans who are still out of a job because of what the pandemic has done to this economy. So please make sure you pray for your pastor and you are praying for the church leaders because right now more than ever, they need your prayers. Y'all hear me? Amen. Amen. I just I had to I had to say that you all. So so in our passage of scripture, Elijah, he's disappointed. He's discouraged and he's de depressed in so much so that he leaves town when he receives the message, when he receives the threat given by Jezebel. He goes some hundred and twenty miles south of where he was. And he drops off his servant in a city named Beersheba and he goes into the wilderness, you all, with one purpose and one purpose only to die a miserable self-pity death. And while he's in the desert, the Bible says he found a broom tree, which is a, a, a type of shrub. And he gets underneath that shrub to get to offer some sense of relief. And while he's under that broom tree, the Bible says he falls asleep. And while he's asleep, or I'm sorry, before he falls asleep, he sits down and he prays to God. And his prayer to God is, Lord, just go ahead and kill me and take me out. I'm no better than my ancestors. He falls asleep and the Bible says that something happened while he was asleep. Let me help you understand something, you all. The first thing, a couple things when it comes to when God brings about restoration or he renews us in certain areas in our life. The first thing or one of the first thing that God will do, you all, is God will get you alone by yourself so that you can have a time to Rest in silence. Notice Elijah is by himself. Nobody is there but him and him alone. And he's resting. Some of you all have to hit the pause button. And you have to learn how to take time to rest. Notice when, when Elijah is resting, he's not worried about What are you going to preach the next day? He's not worrying about going to go visit a member and to have prayer with them. He's not worrying about how Sunday school is going. 
He's not worrying about ministry related things. He's simply resting and God starts the process of restoring this man of God. And again, understand it's a process that takes time. Now, in this process, you are, and I want y'all to see this, in this process of restoration, as, as the prophet is being restored in his mind, his body, and his soul, I want you to understand what God does that is a part of any restoration process when he is restoring you or renewing you, <clears throat> excuse me, in any specific area in your life, whether it be he's restoring and renewing you from um, depression, disappointment or discouragement, whether he's restoring or renewing you in another department in your life. God does certain things. And when you look at Elijah, you all, the text says this. So God allowed him to rest. God didn't come and criticize him like I said last week. He didn't castigate him. God didn't blame him. God didn't call him a failure. God let the man rest. Now watch this, you all. Then the Bible says that God provided food, something to drink, and God also provided Encourage me. Oh, y'all, y'all just missed what I just said. You know why? Because you ain't shouting. In this passage of scripture, you all, what we learn about the restoration process when, when God is seeking to restore us or renew us in a specific area in our life where we are suffering, where our spiritual vitality is lacking and we're dry. God will restore us and bring us back to full vitality by doing this one major thing, you all, and that's this. Provision. Oh, y'all ain't hear what I'm saying. Provision, meaning that God provides and provision deals with God providing what we need, not what we want. God gave Elijah what he needed, not what he wanted. Remember what he wanted. Y'all better walk with me right now. What he wanted was for God to kill him. He wanted to die. This man had suicidal ideations going through his mind. This just goes to show you again just how deep he was in his depression. Whenever a person gets to the point when they say they no longer want to live and their prayer to God is for them to die and not live that point that person has gone has reached an all-time low in their depression and some of you all right now who I'm talking to you know what I'm talking about because for some of you all you've been there before you've been to that place before you know how that place feels you know how that place smells you know how that place tastes you know how that place sounds for some of you all, you're at that place right now and you've been crying out to God. And I'm here to tell you right now, God will provide. And it is a part of the restoration process, you all. And all throughout the scriptures, the Bible makes it clear that God meets our needs and that God and God alone will provide. Let's look at a couple passages of scriptures, you all. Excuse me. Um, let's look at Philippians chapter four, verse 19. Here's what the word of the Lord says. Philippians chapter four, verse 19 says this. And my God, this is the apostle Paul talking. And my God will supply every need. Oh, help me. Holy Ghost of yours, according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Oh, now that we could do a sermon series on that one passage of scripture right there. You are. I promise you four part sermon series. I could do a four part sermon series through the grace of God on that one passage right there. Do you know how much meat is on that bone right there? You all the, the apostle said, and my God, first of all, he recognizes possessive that God is his God. My God will supply. He didn't say may this shows faith. He says, my God will supply every need of yours. He's telling the church. 
that he's writing to. Listen, I know from firsthand experience, you all, that God will supply your needs, that God will provide you with the provision that you need. And he said, because I know this, I'm going to let you all know that he will supply all of your needs according to his riches and his glories in Christ Jesus It's all found in Christ Jesus, not outside of Christ Jesus, you all. We're talking about God's provision. Look at Psalm 34, verse 10. It says, the young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Now, right there, you all, you better go ahead and shout. The writer is saying right there, he's acknowledging this passage of scripture is an acknowledgement of the provision of God that God provides for his people. Psalm 23 and one, a very popular psalm that many of you all are familiar with. The first line in that that psalm, you all, in verse one says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Well, why do you not want? Well, he doesn't want because the Lord is his shepherd and he supplies all of his needs. David is talking about and acknowledging the provision of God. And last you all, Psalm 37 verses 25 through 26. Another very popular Psalm says, Psalm says this, excuse me. I have been young and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. He is ever lending generously and his children become a blessing. So again, we see throughout the scriptures that God is a God who is in his character and his nature to provide. And you see again, all throughout the biblical narrative, look at how God provided for his people. He provided for Noah. He provided for Abraham. Y'all better walk with me right now. He provided for Adam and Eve, even when they messed up and they sinned and they knew that they were naked. The Bible says that God, before he expelled them out of the garden, God took innocent animals, right? And he draped Adam and Eve with the coat of those animals to provide provision for clothing for them so that they will not go without. He provided for the nation of Israel. You see how he ripped them out and rescued them from out of slavery. All throughout the scriptures, you all, we see that God provides and he provides for his people. But what God wants us to understand is that when it comes to him restoring us, God wants us to recognize, God wants us to believe, God wants us to trust. God wants us to have faith in him that he will provide us with what we need and not what we want. That's so important to understand when it comes to this restoration process because it takes time. And we see with Elijah, God provides for him. He provides the food and the water. He he, he provides rest to allow him to sleep. He provides him with encouragement as he sends an angel, a divine messenger to the man of God. But I also want you to understand this when it comes to this process, you all, of restoration. We have to work in partnership with God. Oh, y'all, I want somebody to type that down right there. Say, I want you to type in the in the box right now. I want you to say we have to be willing participants. We have to be willing participants. What do you mean, preacher? Make it make sense. Okay, watch this, you all. I want you to look at at verse at verse five. Verse five says, and he lay down and slept under a broom tree and behold, an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. Okay, so the angel appears. The angel gives Elijah a directive. He gives him a commandment and the commandment is you need to get up and you need to eat. Now, notice that the Bible didn't say that Elijah in his deep depression said, leave me alone because we know and you know. When you're disappointed or discouraged or depressed and you're down in the dumps, you don't want nobody messing with you a lot of times. You turn off your cell phone, (laughs) lock your door to your room. You don't want anybody to disturb you. Notice when the angel touched Elijah, he didn't say, leave me alone. Go, man. He didn't say that. The Bible says the opposite. 
He did what the angel instructed him to do. What you talking about, preacher? When it comes to God restoring us in specific areas in our life where we have or we are experiencing, experiencing diminished spiritual vitality, God looks for us <clears throat> to uphold our end of the bargain by being obedient to the instructions that he gives us. Now, see, somebody right now is praising God because I just said something right now that's already started you, that's already started or, or, or has become, is going to be the catalyst for your breakthrough. And it ain't deep, you all. It's very simplistic. Obedience. We have to learn how to obey God when he gives a directive. All throughout scripture, you all, you got to, we got to be able to look all throughout the Bible. Do you know that according to Deuteronomy chapter 28, when God made the covenant with the nation of Israel, he told them that the blessings that they were going to experience, that he is going to give them, that they were predicated upon their ability to adhere or to obey what God has instructed them in the law. God says, you don't obey these things, then you're not going to get these blessings. On the other hand, you're going to get some curses. What you trying to say, preacher? What I'm trying to say is, could it be <clears throat> that the reason that you have failed to experience, watch this, you all. Could it be that the reason that you have failed to experience restoration or renewal in a specific area in your life, that you've been praying and asking God and other people to pray for you for is because God done already given you instructions on what you need to do, but you have failed to follow through and obey those instructions. Now that right there is a word for somebody. What you talking about, preacher? Make it make sense. Give me enough time and I will. Here's an example. Some of you all know unequivocally, no one needs to tell you, some of you all know that you have anger problems. And some of you all are, 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 are so aware of your anger problems that you even know what the source of your anger is and that God has already showed you and God has already instructed you what you need to do, but you have failed to do it. Let me go a little bit deeper. Some of you all have anger issues because you're dealing with a underlining issue. See, the anger is just a symptom to what the primary cause is. Ooh mm, mm, mm. See, we got to learn how to watch this, you all. You, we have to learn how to find out what the primary cause is and don't be tricked by the symptoms. See, any good physician will tell you that when it comes to treating the body, you don't treat the symptoms, you treat the primary cause. And sometimes it takes time to get to what the primary cause is. But once you get to the primary cause and you deal with that, then you won't have to deal with experiencing those symptoms anymore. So some of you all have the symptoms of anger, hatred and bitterness. These are symptoms to a deeper underlining primary cause. And for some of you all, that primary cause is abandonment. Because your mother or your father abandoned you when you were young. Never had a relationship with your dad. So you have so much anger built up in you and you act out that anger. And God has already shown you what you need to do in order to treat that primary cause. God done already showed you, you have to forgive. You have to forgive and release what that person or those persons have done to you if you want to be restored and renewed in that particular area in your life. But some of us, we have refused to do it. So we still deal with that anger and that hatred and that bitterness. And other people experience that when they come around you to the point where nobody even really wants to be around you because you're always angry and you're always mad. So again, in the restoration process, you all, God will instruct us to do certain things and we have to be open to following the voice of God and we have to stand ready to do what God instructs us to do. Elijah listened and he obeyed 
what God told him to do. And he didn't just do it one time, you all. He did it two times. I want you to also look at this, this second part. I want you to look at this second part as we talk about this restoration process. So when the angel appeared to Elijah again, look at verse seven, you all. It says, and the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, arise and eat for the journey is too great for you. Now, notice this time the angel adds a detail, adds some detail that he didn't add the first time. Now, keep this in mind, you all. We have no idea how long Elijah stayed at this location where he was under this broom tree. To be quite frankly honest with you, it really doesn't matter. And we don't need to know that. It's inferred from the text that this was all a process. He's sleeping. He's lying down. He's sleeping. He's lying down. The Bible says that the angel in verse seven tells him. Arise and eat for the journey is too great for you. Watch this, you all. God knows that while we are down here on this earth. Every person has their own journey that they are on. Do you understand what I'm saying? And God knows that each person's journey is great. Each person's journey is also going to have some hills and some valleys. And God knows this in so much that for Elijah at this particular time and for his journey, God sends an angel who represents one of his messengers to encourage him to eat. Oh, Lord, thank you, God. I love that God will send people in our lives to help restore and renew us. He will allow them to be a part of the restoration process. And we acknowledge and said this last week. God will allow people to be a part of the, re the restoration process, you all, and the renewal process as God is trying to restore you in certain areas of your life. But if you slap their hand and tell them to leave, then you're not turning away that person. You're turning away God and the help of the Lord. In this passage of scripture, the angel lets the prophet know that the journey that you have that is ahead of you is a great journey. Therefore, you need to make sure that you are consuming the provisions that God is giving you. And notice this, y'all. The Bible says that he arose, he ate, ate and drank, which means he was obedient again. And the text says, and he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Horeb. Now, let me ask you all this. Let me ask you all this real quick. I want you all to type this in the description box. I want to see my biblical scholars out there. Can somebody tell me what is the significance of Mount Horeb? And remember, Mount Horeb is also Mount Sinai. Can anybody tell me what is the significance of Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai in the Bible? What's the significance of it? Go ahead and type that in there. What's the significance? If you said the significance is the manifestation of God's presence and power, you are absolutely right, you all. See, in this passage of scripture, we're told, we're told that the prophet is on his way to Mount Horeb. Now, why in the world is he on his way to Mount Horeb? We're going to deal fully with that next week. But I'm going to go ahead and just give you a little taste test. Why is he on his way to Mount Horeb? Because something in the past has happened at Mount Horeb. And there's something that's going to happen in Elijah's future that's going to happen at Mount Horeb. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying right now. We are told in the biblical narrative that it was at Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter three, verse one, where God appeared to Moses in the burning bush, which we call theologically a, the a theophany. We're also told that God also appeared to Moses in Exodus chapter 19, verse one. In verse 11 and verse 20, he appeared to Moses on Mount Sinai and he gave what? The 10 
commandments. Oh, y'all ain't walking with me right now, you all. That Mount Horab in the scriptures, especially in the Old Testament, represents a place where God has manifested himself, his power and his presence. We also are told in Exodus chapter 33 and 18 that it was at Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai where Moses begged God to show him his glory. Oh, y'all ain't walking with me right now. So Mount Horeb represents the place where God has revealed or manifest himself. And the Bible tells us that this is where the prophet is going. He's on his way to Mount Horeb. But watch this, you all. Oh, I'm going to say this and I'm done. But before he can get to the place where God is going to manifest himself, his power and his presence and speak to Elijah in such a special and a unique way that is a part of his restoration process. Before he can get to that place, Elijah first had to go through the process because it takes time. Time And the text says that Elijah ate the food and that on the account of that food that he ate, he was able to go 40 days and 40 nights. Now, listen, you all, y'all done missed that. Please help me understand what meal do you know of that you or I can eat that will allow us to run on energy? For 40 days and 40 nights. There ain't no power bar. There ain't no steak. Ain't no protein. There's nothing that has been developed food wise that a person can eat that will allow them to be sustained for 40 days and 40 nights. So you know what that means, you all? This right here was a supernatural meal that God prepared. Only God can do it the way God can do it. You know why? Because won't he do it? Yes, he will. God knows how to provide. Nobody can beat God with providing. And I just stopped by today to tell somebody by the mercies of God that God wants to restore you, but you got to open up your heart and allow God to be and do what God is trying to be and do in your life. Stop turning people away who God has sent to be a part of your restoration process. Take time to rest up and sleep on, but understand that God is investing all of these things in you. Understand that God is restoring you for one primary purpose, one primary purpose. Yes, he loves you. Yes, he cares for you. Yes, he's gracious. Yes, he's kind. Yes, he is a God of second chances. And Jonah knows that, but he's doing all of this for one primary purpose, you all. And that purpose is this. God desires to use you again. And God wants you to be restored to full force and full vitality so that when you step back on the spiritual battlefield, he can use you in all your strength and all your might. And you can take those experiences and you can use those to minister to other others God never does anything in a vacuum vacuum you all God provided for this man of God he took and he's taken him through a process of restoration you all and we're going to pick up next week as we look at what how this process continued but for today again I want you all to know this That when it comes to you being restored, when it comes to me being restored and renewed in certain areas of our life, it takes time because it is a process. Let us go to God in prayer. Oh, gracious and everlasting God, Lord, we thank you in the name of Jesus. Father God, we pray and we ask that you would be with us as you continue to restore and renew us. Lord, allow our hearts and minds to be open and receptive to the restoration process. In Jesus' name, amen.